What is going on? You are listening to Tags Podcast, a.k.a. Talk About Gay Sex Podcast. I'm your host, Steve V. This is episode 329. And on this episode, I'm very excited to talk to author David Pevsner about his brand new memoir, Damn Shame, Desire, Defiance, and Show Tunes, which drops the book is out today january 11th and i read this book in three days oh my gosh it's such a juicy memoir of his life sex shaming body positivity escorting and so much more it's a juicy riveting read and very relatable i might add i think you're gonna like this so stay tuned for that also this wednesday january 12th is my birthday so tune in for tags live with cody maurice doggett and myself at six o'clock pacific time nine o'clock eastern time on the get vocal platform you can find that on tagspodcast.com. Join us. It will be a fun live podcast of on my birthday. So excited for that. And this Wednesday, the 12th through the 14th, in honor of my birthday, it, you can get Tags swag. I'm talking about tank tops for literally $13 t-shirts and tanks and everything of our tags swag i'm talking from mugs to stickers to hoodies is up to 35 percent off so you want to take advantage of it while it's on sale that's the sale for tags merchandise beginning this wednesday my birthday january 12th through the 14th up to 35 percent off go to tagspodcast.com and click on the link tags merch well here is my conversation with author David Pevsner of Damn Shame, the brand new book out today. Today we are welcoming David Pevsner and just a little background on him. Over the course of his 40-year career in show business, David Pevsner has done it all. He's acted on Broadway, off-Broadway, in indie film and numerous TV shows, including Grey's Anatomy, Modern Family, and Criminal Minds. And away from the stage and the cameras, Pevsner has dedicated himself to exploring his deep deepest sexual fantasies. In his late 30s, he became a male escort, which we're definitely talking about that. And over the last several years, has attracted a large international fan base through his blog of erotic and nude photographs, celebrating his 62-year-old body. Uh, Damn Shame is the book out today, I believe January 11th, when this comes out. It's David's incredible story and is a passionate and poignant look at one man's journey from a thin, shy boy ashamed of his body and sexuality to a defiant, fearless, every man exploring his erotic desires. Love that. And along the way, he fights back against society, demonization of gay sex, body shaming, and ageism while pursuing his own personal definition of success and seeking love, validation, and self esteem. Uh, David, welcome to Tag's podcast. And first off, I just love, love, love uh, the the memoir. Oh, thank you so much. And wow, I mean, when you were going through that, that is everything the book is about. <laughs> it's epic. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot, but um, it's all in there. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I loved, I love a good memoir in general, I have to say just Me first too. off, and especially one that I can relate to. And I have to say, David, I related to so many of your stories, obviously totally different lives, but at 50 myself here, also a former actor, I also moved to LA in 1998, which I believe you did. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I uh, have pivoted my career several times. Um, I'm now unapologetic about my sexuality, or at least I am, I won't put those words in your mouth, but, and especially, <laughs> especially by hosting uh, this OG sex positive podcast here um, over the last five years. Um, I also grew up with incredible amounts of shame. Catholicism, of course, was my mm -hmm. background. And so uh, just a huge, huge, big thank you for writing this book. And of course, I loved all of the New York old references, things yeah. like Raymond Dragon. I, I have <laughs> love that. I used to have a crush on him. Um, Big Cup Coffee on 8th Avenue. Of course, I got to go to it even when I didn't live here. Yeah. 
I got to go to the Gaiety on 42nd before they shut down. And of course, places like Splash. Um, so thanks for, for writing this. Sure. Uh, really cool. I mean, I, I moved to New York in 82. So I was there, you know, during the tough time of AIDS. But we did have a good time. And we had the Big Cup. And we had Splash. And we had Uncle Charlie's. And, we, you know, Gaiety. Everything I talk about in there um, is a lot for people who were there um, either all through it or at the tail end of it will really get a kick out of, I think. Yeah. And, you know, just in thinking right now, I'm sure you've been back and forth to New York, uh, maybe not so much recently, but what's your thoughts on, you know, the, the Hey, Oh, I like to say heyday, the eighties, even the nineties versus like what you see in New York today. Well, I actually don't spend that much time there as much as I would like, because I still have friends there. Um, and it is kind of weird, like I'll go and like, oh, that closed and oh, that's gone. Right. <laughs> you know, um, a lot of my friends say that the city isn't what it used to be and maybe not. But every time I do go back, it's still it's a, it's a it's an entity unto itself. It's like no other place in the world. And though, you know, the stuff that I experience that I love maybe isn't there anymore. There's new stuff, you know, Um the culture is always going to be there. The men are always going to be there. Um, yeah, it's still, I, I know it's not the city I left in 98, that we left in 98. Um, or no, that, you know, you, when did you get to New York? I, I, you know, I first visited New York in 94 and that's how I was able to go to places like Gaiety, gotcha. but didn't move here until 2008. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So that was 10 years after I left. Yeah. Um, you know, I just, I, I still miss it. I do. And for all the people who say, well, you know, it's not the same. I'm like, yeah, but it's, it's, it's still New York. It's not the same. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Absolutely. Well, we have to talk about, you know, so the first part, act one of your book, damn shame. And the whole book is stories of, of just shame. And, and I would even say trauma that, you know, as many of us gay men, have mm-hmm. uh, I mean everybody? I'm sure does. I was just going to say it's not yeah. just gay men. I've learned no, but on this this show, you know, we do a lot of talking about shame in general and just how oftentimes you have to kind of just look back at, at where did this come from? Otherwise, yeah. you're repeating the same mistakes, not having great relationships, and um, you did the one part that I remember reading um, on page seventy four. You are in class at that, I think it's that horrible school. You were at Carnegie. Is that Carnegie right? Mellon. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't Carnegie all horrible, but there was no, some I know, shitty I know. stuff that went on. Yeah. Yeah. And you write, about. you write, I was recalling the time at recess when my gym buddies, it was an exercise you had to recall. Yeah. And you're recalling when Gabe Kovinsky and Dale Lipschitz mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> double teamed me. And you write, not in a good way. <laughs> um, Gabe pushing me over Dale on his hands and knees, me falling to the ground, dirty clothes, ripped, humiliated. And then a little bit later, you write, I ached physically and emotionally. And this is because you did this exercise. Mm -hmm. I bawled my eyes out, you write, choking and keening. I'd never dealt with that traumatic memory as an adult, but the detail of what I was wearing immediately took me back to the scenario. And I experienced the stabbing pain and humiliation all over again for a live audience. Um, I can't help but think that, you know, because I've done acting exercises like that, but um, that's really going back to feel the trauma. And do you think sometimes maybe we gloss over some of our trauma? Oh, absolutely. Oh my gosh. I mean, when I, that particular story, I write about when it happened early on, like in the, in the section about me going to grammar school and everything and getting, you know, beaten up on the, at recess and kind of like, it hurt me and it, you know, it made me cry and it, you know, it hurt my feelings and all of that. But it wasn't until I did that exercise in that class. And when she said to me, and in fact, the, the, the interesting, cause I, you know, I was somebody who always loved clothes. You know, yeah. I, I was always like the, the best dressed guy in school. Um, and in this class, she asked me, I was kind of telling the story very matter of factly, kind of how I'm telling it to you now. And <laughs> right. it was, you know, just like, and this happened and this happened and this happened. And then she said to me, what were you wearing? And that's when I thought, and I, and my eyes were still closed and the class was watching me. And I went, my brown corduroy. 
right? And I just start. <gasps> I mean, I, it just set me off like a crazy person in front of the class. I had no control over it. It was so deep down embedded that embarrassment, that shame, that fear. I mean, that's what that's what the kids, you know, that's what they did back then. They called me faggot. And that's something that you may not deal with it until you're ready to deal with it. You know? Yeah, it's interesting you brought up the word faggot because as a young, you know, early grade school, I remember um, being called that when I didn't throw, I think I didn't throw, I was being pitcher on the softball PE. <sighs> nightmare. Yeah, nightmare, nightmare. <laughs> and I, yeah, I know total nightmare and I did not want to do that. And I, I guess I threw it like a girl, which is a horrible thing to say, but, or maybe I just threw it like me and it just wasn't good enough. And mm -hmm. I got called a faggot and that now I think I can tell that story, but I bet if I did that exercise, that was really traumatic. And I remember yeah. that stayed with me. The fact that I can still remember pitching that ball, um, you know, who remembers a lot of specific details about their childhood, but I remember that. Yeah. And I if remember, you really, yeah. If you really put yourself in that moment, the details come to you and they're very upsetting. You know? Yeah, and it, it kind of parlays to a lot of, you talk a lot about being in the locker room and changing, which so many of us can relate to. Um, I, you know, I, I just think about that whole transition of when, you know, you weren't very comfortable with your body as a kid, you you stared in the mirror, you write a lot, mm -hmm. um, to a huge transition later where it's the other extreme where many people will never get to about body positivity and mm -hmm. which we'll get into a little bit more, but talk a little bit about, cause it's really fun to read. Um, I mean, cause I can relate to it about yeah. those early locker room days. Well, I don't think early, early on, like when I first started gym class and going to the JCC with my dad, it wasn't so much about, Ooh, look at all the guys. I like that. It wasn't that at all. I didn't really even know that until, well, I mean, I kind of knew it, but it was more focused on me on, I don't want to show my penis. I don't want to show my ass. I'm skinny. I look, I don't look like you guys out there. I'm just embarrassed. So taking off my clothes, having to, in, in the shower that we had um, in grammar school, from what I remember, it was a communal shower. So everybody kind of showered together. It wasn't stalls. So I would, and you, you didn't have a towel until you got to the end of your shower. So you stood in line naked, you, you went to a shower stall and showered and then got your towel. And that is an awfully long time to stand <laughs> yes. there being embarrassed. And then in, when it got to be where I was kind of understanding that I liked the male body, it was hard to keep my dick down, you know? So can relate to that. <laughs> like yeah. covering my hands. I mean, even wrote a whole song about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's that song called? It's called Fight the Urge. And it's about three guys in gym class trying not to get hard ons in the shower. <laughs> and it's a very sweet, very funny song, but it's it comes out of my total truth. I thought showering in a public place was an absolute fucking nightmare. Couldn't stand yeah. it. Yeah, it's so funny because I totally can relate to that too. And it's that paranoia that you, you're you just convinced that no other kid is experiencing but you. Right. You're alone on an island and please, please, please do not get hard, please. But you're also uncomfortable with your body too. So it's that shameful part that you're just not comfortable yet with, with your body. And it, it's just... That paralleled with later on in the book, when you finally are on page 113, you write at the bottom, I finally had muscles and I loved showing them off. Thanks to International Mail. Love that <laughs> catalog. Mm -hmm. And any gay clothing shop I could find my gym wear became tight little shorts and teeny tiny string tank tops that barely covered my growing pecs. And I was rarely seen without my nipples to the wind and a prominent bulge at my crotch. Um, later you write, uh, I think this is you in the steam room when you were on tour. I so enjoyed strutting around the hallways in nothing but a towel, knowing I was new meat in town and that my pecs, my arms, and the obvious tenting of that towel 
could turn heads. Sometimes I'd forego the towel altogether and just wander the place in nothing but a metal cock ring and join the random hands reaching out to touch my fluffed up dick as I passed by. Wow, what a contrast, too, uh, between the, the two times. <laughs> yeah. I love a bathhouse. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I say in one of the lines that towards the end of the book is that I talk about how I've dealt with body shame. And I say that as a kid, I covered up, but as an adult, I stripped down. And it was, yeah. both, and they were both kind of what I needed to do, you know, in order to just preserve my sanity in a way, because body shame is really pervasive. It's awful. And when you have it, you know, and, and bring it into your adult years, it becomes even more complicated, you know, and, and it's just something that I have always been aware of my whole life. I, if, if there's one, except for wanting to like sing and dance and entertain people, my connection with my body and how I felt about it has been a lifelong journey. Yeah. And, and still to this day, I want to talk a little later about ageism and so forth yeah. and how you're still actually um, positively, I think, putting yourself out there. And I think that's so great. Um, but still sticking with when you were younger, um, you, you were talking about, we talked about being bullied and, I couldn't help but notice that you didn't have, like myself, um, a lot of examples to look up to. And yeah. like you, I looked, you know, there weren't like today, there's a lot of you, there's a lot of young gay actors that you could as role models. Mm -hmm. But back then you had actors that were straight, of course, that or at least we thought they were. And you talk about hugging your pillow yeah. and as if that was kind of filled the void there. Um, it's awkward to read, but I totally can relate to it, too, because I did the <laughs> same thing. I think mine, you listed a lot of yours. Mine was Steve Austin, the $6 million man mm, that I was, course. you know, panting out to and praying that my mom didn't hear me say Steve. And if she did, it would be like, well, that's me. I'm just saying my name. <laughs> so, I know. How convenient. Yeah. yeah you, you could only be attracted to men named Steve. Then mom exactly. would never know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, it didn't go unnoticed later in the book that, you know, although people of a certain age didn't have a lot of, say, role models, you talk later on in the book about how even today there are role models, but there is still cyberbullying going on. And, and you talk about reading, um, watching the m movie Trevor, which is yeah. a prelude to the Trevor Project. So. Um, can you just talk about that just a little well, bit? Well, that's even before cyberbullying, Trevor. Um, uh, true, yes. And, and so now the fact that, you know, you can say anything about anyone anonymously and send it off, um, you know, some people are like, I, I'm used to it. You know, like you put yourself out there the way I have. I'm used to it. Say whatever you want. I don't care. You know, there are other people who don't feel that way. And sometimes it's kind of funny. So it's like mean right. tweet. It's like, you know, mean tweets on, on Jimmy Kimmel. I've read what I call the poison posts about me and kind of go like, well, you know what? There's enough people out there who are, I, I want to focus on the positive. You know, I'm not going to let that kind of thing stop me from doing what I'm doing, you know? But yeah, I mean, my understanding is that the suicide rate of young kids is up and has been going right. up consistently. So that even though we have more role models out there, there is more material for them to look at that's a positive. Um, they still, there's the internet and the internet, it's them sitting at their computer alone, taking in some of the negative stuff and, right. you know, and, and, and how do you deal with it? I mean, not everyone goes to a shrink. Not everybody has somebody to talk to. If you're in the closet, you know, if somebody like calls you a faggot online, it's some, one of those student forums or something, you know, what do you do? Who do you talk to if you're not out, you know? Right. It's just, it's, it's just this, uh, it just it just hurts my heart so much that we've come this far and yet right you no know, and yet we're still there's still the evan you know the, the the evangelical families where you know the father would rather the kid be dead than be gay you know don't think that doesn't happen of course it does so uh, just, right and when you don't have like the amount of history like yourself and myself have to kind of you know like you say focus on the positive. I think you're right when you put yourself out there. And 
one can argue everybody is in some way, shape or form putting themselves out there. Well, you if you're are, a public person at yeah. any level, at any level. And it, I went through a long period when I first started my career and I was doing theater. I never got a bad review. For years, I never got a bad review, and I was like, "Oh, I'm good," you know. But <laughs> right, and my first bad review took I took to my bed for three days, and it was ridiculous because you're going to get good and you're going to get bad. It doesn't matter how long your streak is, <laughs> you know. You make five good movies, and the sixth one is a dog. And believe me, actors who make those dog movies don't even think about the five positive ones before that. They're like, "Shit," you know. That all the right. negative stuff tends to hit us harder than the positive stuff. And I'm saying that as a generality. I'm not saying for everybody. No, but absolutely. That, but you kind of learn, you know, I, I was a, I, I'm a personal organizer on the side. And I have to say that the best part of it, besides that I really enjoy doing it, is that I am not paid to come into somebody's house and go, yeah, it's really messy. It's a problem. And, oh, gee, I know how you feel. No, I'm in there to go, okay, well, that's what it is now. But we're going to make it better. I'm going to make this place so fucking great that you're going to be so, so I have, I can't commiserate with my clients. I have to be the one to come in and give the positive attitude and let them know that everything's going to get better. And I've taken that into my life, you know, like my whole life. Not that I was that much of a negative person before, but I could definitely see, you know, the, the, the glass half empty thing. Yeah, so absolutely. There's something about having a more positive attitude, as cynical as I can be about it, that really does help. And you can only get that with confidence and self-esteem. And those are not things that they teach in school. And those are not things you necessarily pick up on the Internet when you're some kid in you know, Bemidji, Minnesota, feeling shitty about themselves and not knowing who to talk to. And we should say, even in some of your cynicism, it's all played out with a wink and a nod and a story to be told yes. that is, you know, really laughing or, you know, seeing where looking back at yourself again, the, the ability to deal with maybe what was traumatic and turning it into a positive. Um, we should also mention that you have your show, a uh, one man show. Mm -hmm. I know you have several of them. But this was funny to me. Um, it's called Musical Comedy Horror. Yes. <laughs> and I tried to look for it. And, and then I read, finished your book. And it's if you want to look for it on Prime, listeners, look for Musical, musical Comedy Stud on Prime. And I found it. And you can Yuck. rent it or buy it or whatever. And so Because they, <laughs> yeah. they wouldn't approve the name. I, we had done it. Um, I had done it on and off over the years. And then I finally got a chance to film it. And we did, we did all the work, turned it in and they were like, sorry, we can't use that. It was the day before we're supposed to drop, <laughs> Yeah, you know, ever. So they were like, no, we can't. So now like, let's, let's make something that's hard to sell to people anyway, even more difficult to find. So now if you're just buying a DVD, it's musical comedy horror, but for streaming on Amazon, because it's a family oriented thing, it's musical comedy stud. Now, Which again, so once again, with how far we've come, you know, with with digitizing and everything, it's not like you have to buy the DVD or rent it. Right. And yet the fact horror. I mean, I think it's in the dictionary if last I checked. Well, yes, but there I mean, what, what's funny to me is I told my friend this. He goes, oh, David, no, I think it's really that they that they have a problem with musical comedy. <laughs> Which is, yeah. I was like, oh, that's it. So I'm going to call it like, you know, singing actor horror. No, that's not going to work. <laughs> exactly. Well, check that out. Um, and I'm assuming because in in your book, you include a lot of songs that you've written throughout the years, which are so funny and parallel the story of your life. Um, well, I couldn't help it. Out, all my lyrics come out of real life stories. so Which is so fun to read. Hey, boys. New year, and that means new sex rules. Start the year off right by manifesting a sex positive 2022. Your buddies over here at Tags have got you covered in helping you achieve your sex conundrums and relationship queries. Ask Tags for advice. We love giving our thoughtful outlooks to our friends, you. So DM us at Tags Podcast on Instagram or email us at tagspodcast.com. Let's make this year a sexually positive 2022.
And so um, I want to move on to sex because that's a fun topic. Yay! Uh, yeah. Um, on the end of page 71, you write, um, this is after, I believe, uh, your, one of your first, Stan, who was your boyfriend, one mm-hmm. of your first boyfriends, correct? Yeah, very first. Yeah. And you write, um, it's ending. Your relationship with Stan is ending. And you write, however, I put his name, you, you you put Stan's name in an empty journal. His was the first in what was going to be my record of everyone I ever slept with in my entire life. And that is part of a song called Book of Lust. Yes. Which um, you write, see this massive volume. It's my comprehens- comprehensive listing of everyone from 40 years of boyfriends, tricks, and trysting. Each name brings back sweet memories from gentle hugs to fisting. Excuse me as I try to keep my roving eye from misting. It took a while to keep the nerve to touch a naked man, but once I did, the flood the floodgates cracked. Here's where it all began with Stan. And that's mm-hmm. again from the book of Lust. I... Love that. I really appreciate how you don't separate or didn't, at least with the bo- your book here, about from boyfriends, tricks, and trysting. It all kind of goes together. You know, some people I feel are like, oh, that's a trick and totally separate from a relationship. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of them had equal meaning to me. You know, like I I could have been with a guy for one time and something happened or there's some connection made that really stuck with me, you know, so it wasn't just like a throwaway. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes absolutely a throwaway. But there were men that I met along the way that um, like I tell the story about the guy that I met at that dance club in in um, Pittsburgh when I was in school and, you know, how. I was just tricking with people that just didn't really like that story is not just there to say, Hey, I slept with this guy. That story is there to tell me about, to say about how judgmental I was about people's bodies, about masculinity and femininity about, you know, I talk about how it used to take me like hours to actually get down to the deed when I would meet somebody. Cause I'd feel like, well, I have to get to know them better, <laughs> right. you know? And so, and in that story, what it's funny to me because I had met this guy at the bar. We'd spent all this time at the bar. It was really late. I went home with him and I was, you know, I was like, well, I just can't sleep with somebody. So I said to him, I said, you know, he was all set. He went and got himself into a caftan. I mean, we were, he was all set. I couldn't, my friends know me. I have a whole joke thing about caftans. It's It's pretty funny. It's so hilarious to me. I love, yes. I make a name (laughs) reference. Mame, yes. Thank you, Mame. Yeah. The Lucille Ball version. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Him Not the better. <laughs> well, but then what was funny was, you know, it was so late and I just went, well, I'd like to, I'd like to maybe get to know you better. And he goes and he just throws himself on the Barca lounge or sits down and goes, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> and so when you said it that way, I was like, I really guess I don't want to know anything, but I, you know, I asked a couple of questions and then I fucked him. So it was, you know, yeah. that's the way I did things back then. It's kind of a funny story. And it's just one of the many kind of like, you know, I'll say screwed up, but certain things I had in my head about sex and men that I just, you know, was hard to sort out. You know, and it was, and I wasn't comfortable talking about all this stuff early on. Now, you know, whatever you want to know, I'll tell you. Um, it's really a fun. I this is where I really related a lot to your writing in the book because I, seeing your trajectory of how you approach sex from not even thinking as a youngin that it was possible for mm-hmm. to have sex with another man because obviously there was no examples. You didn't think it would ever happen. You talk about the pillow, I I relate to that, to later maybe wanting to approach it, but thinking that, oh, I would never want to suck a dick because that's dirty, Mm -hmm. and how could anybody do that, to, like my life, just the years, over the years, really uh, through circumstances expanding, you know, literally, and just my mind on what I want to try, and... I've gotten into the leather community in various forms and it's just really, I hope everybody kind of has like that growth factor on the possibilities of sex. Well, I think, you know, sometimes people limit themselves because they're afraid. Sometimes they limit because they don't know how to do it. 
Um, and not just afraid of like what might happen, but things like, you know, diseases and, and, you know, yes, g- yes. having like casual sex and some guy beating you up or something. I mean, you know, all that shit has gone through my head, believe me, because I'm somebody who's very, you know, careful about stuff. But I also knew that I was feeling really unfulfilled and feeling very, um, like there was something inside of me that the world would not approve of. And yet I wanted so badly to explore it. And so when you're somebody who's, you know, tr- who's a people pleaser and, you know, tries to be the good Jewish boy like I was, I was not inclined to go with those impulses. But certain things happened in life where I just kind of went, you know what? I, my desire to do it trumps my desire to be a good boy. Quote, good, unquote, boy. <laughs> yes. You know, And we should say that, you know, you do definitely talk about the AIDS uh, era Mm -hmm. and I could definitely, I didn't live in New York, but I definitely can relate to the fear that so many of us felt Mm -hmm. on just forget, you know, forget about sex, just getting tested. And um, I, you do a really good job of explaining that whole period and how, you still probably carry a lot of that. I think it was a traumatic time if you were young and so many of us carry those memories, they don't go away. And not to mention the people and loved ones that you lost. Yeah. I think, you know, guys or anybody in that generation who dealt with AIDS, um, friends, you know, dying, friends getting sick. um, It it is, it's, it's like scar tissue that won't leave. And I think some guys move on better from it than others do. I, it's still, it still is an issue with me. And I still, you know, I continue to have safe sex. And, um, I think about friends, like there was, I write about the story about Kalani in the book, the guy that I meet at the Columbia dance. And I kind of forgotten about him until I sat down to write the book, but he was one of the earliest people that I knew who died of AIDS. And when, because I was so in love with him and it was a very brief kind of flirtation that we had, but when I heard that he died, like a couple of years later, I read it in a magazine. I, my legs fell out from under me. I, oh, I mean, yeah. the pain. One day you're this like wonderfully beautiful, nice, sweet guy, and the next day you're gone. That's what happened. And, right. And I, I tell this story a lot. But when the movie The Normal Heart came on HBO with Mark Ruffalo and Matt Bomer, I thought they did a really good job. And yet I talked to so many younger guys who didn't like the movie. They were like, oh, it was so over the top. It's like, no, no, it was not. It was not. That's what it was like back then. About an epidemic, my God. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, but, but it brought us closer together as a community because we all knew that we know nobody knew who was safe, you know, for until we kind of discovered really how it was transmitted. But it was a real tough time. But it was a brotherhood that I will never forget um, going yeah. through that with it with the rest of my gay brothers and sisters, you know? Yeah. I mean, ju- I'm glad. And it's not I'm over, by the way. It's definitely not over. Yeah. I'm glad that there are art forms like The Normal Heart. Um, my co- One of my co-hosts is 30 and I cannot, he, he actually lo- loved the movie and references it all the time. Great. So it was just really good. I also think your book is going to be such a good art form for so many people to know. I mean, you know, we have so many examples of historical moments that you can study and documentaries if you want to learn about and everybody should, Mm -hmm. but it's time for the personal accounts and the personal stories. And that's what damn shame really does. It's we need, everyone has a story to be told and you really do a deep dive, which I think so many people will benefit from and be entertained. That's the best part of it all. Um, we have to pivot to escorting, which uh, <laughs> <laughs> sex to escorting. Um, I love all the accounts that come about your escorting days. And essentially it's, you're doing theater here in New York. You've even, at this point, when you decide, have you been on Broadway yet? When you first- Yes, I had been on Broadway. Okay. Yeah, countless shows and, but, you know, as any actor knows, you know, when you've got a hit show and you're making money, then the the next week it could totally turn around. And you, through, 
you've always had a desire, if you will, to kind of want to explore that. And you do. And you call yourself an old older escort getting into it, but you're really in your 30s, correct? I was start? 36, but it was considered... <laughs> to me, that's young, but, that, but I know what you mean. I was considered older. Um, you know, a lot of the guys who were escorting were in their 20s, you know, and in 20, 25. And that's, it seemed to be what people wanted. But this organ, this um, um, agency was called Maturity Escorts, specifically looking for older guys. Which is so fun to read because you talk about slice of life and getting in what (laughs) your life was like. Mo is your booker, I guess. Yeah, he was my pimp, essentially. Your pimp? Yeah, your agent? Yeah, I give him a bunch of names and then it's like, whatever you want to call him, call him. I love that. (laughs) Who essentially... You, the whole uh, audition process to get into his agency and then is a great read. I'll let people read that. But then you'll check in with All him. All true. All true. Okay. I love that. You, I love when you check in with him or he checks in with you. I've got a client. Um, there's a great story in there. We'll let people read where you fill in for somebody yep. that can't make it, who goes by the name of Reno, which probably wasn't his name either, which is hilarious. I mean, I mean Reno, really? I know. And then, they, and then they, in, in the middle of it, they snag me because they got the, one of the guys was like, what's your name again? And I'm like, David, uh, Reno. Uh, Cause I forgot, you know, I was so, it was the first time I'd ever done it. And it was with two guys. I was a nervous wreck, but I couldn't show that. You know? Right. Yeah. You were in the part. Well, like a good actor, you were in the part. And um, I, I have to ask you, was Mild to Wild Squirt your real name that you went by when you were on, like, I guess, online? Later on. Later um, on. Okay. Later on. Yeah, after that would make I, sense. Yeah. yeah. After I worked with an agency, um, when I moved to Los Angeles, I did it on my own for a while. And I did it through AOL chat rooms. So yeah, Mild to Wild I, Escort was my name. Um, Some of the great stories that you tell is of, you, you know, your writing, your writing screenplays, plays, your music, and you've got AOL on in the background. And whenever some, when it dings, you just look and see and set up an appointment. And yep. I it was thought one of those very like, efficient. Well, that's, look, you know, it wasn't something that I was doing all the time, but it was, A, I enjoyed it and B, I could use the money, you know? So I would continue late at night, um, working, writing doing you know all the other stuff that i did yes i guess it was very efficient i never thought of it that way (laughs) but you know because sometimes i'd be working till one in the morning and somebody would pop up and then it was like oh okay so i guess i'm gonna go there now um can you talk a little bit about what your thoughts you write a little bit about what you provided a little bit about the difference between maybe the shame that was associated around your escorting days and Mm -hmm. then about how you approached it, like you have a theory on what you actually provided for your client. Well, I think part of it was the stereotype of it. When somebody thinks about like a male escort, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. people who don't know anything about it are like, oh, he does drugs and then he goes and has sex. And then, you know, (laughs) maybe he beats up his client or whatever. I mean, you know, there are so (laughs) many stereotypes about male escorts from way back when. Going and nowhere in life. Yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. No, no focus except on his dick and what, you know, right. how much can, and I'm sure, look, there are guys who were that way. Sure. Um, I can only talk about my personal experience. And for me, after I got over the whole, like, oh my God, I'm actually doing this. Right. I realized that everybody had different needs and being kind of like, you know, a little bit of a sex pig myself, but also a real caretaker kind of guy, an entertainer, um, a listener, um, just all the attributes that I feel I have as David Pevsner out in the world. I found that I needed to use those when I would have clients because not everybody wanted me to come in, fuck them and leave. Some guys yeah, didn't one guy want to have like martinis with you oh, and just talk for the full many hour? times, many times <laughs> I would go and we would sit and we would drink and talk. And he was just a really sweet guy. And sometimes it would end in sex and sometimes it was a kiss. And that was great. Thank you. You know, there yeah. were guys who like, you know, I remember one guy, um, I went to a hotel in Los Angeles and he I was having a hard time parking. So I was like, I don't know if I was texting. I said, I don't know if I'm going to get up there. He said, please do come up here. I really would like you to be here. So I went there and it was this guy and his wife had just died recently. And he was struggling with his own thing, you know? And so he just, 
he wanted to experience some com- some connection you know he wanted right. to live out his authentic life inside plus he had that that pain and the sorrow which you know i would never be little no matter who it is and best friend or you know guy i'm fucking in the in the bathhouse you know pain is real and people act out on pain in in many different ways and sometimes i would get them as a cl- as a client after some you know kind of lousy thing that happened to them or just if they were feeling lousy or bad about themselves um some would even feel bad about hiring somebody and so i was there to to say like no this is great we're going to have a great time you know and I love that. and usually when i would leave they would be like i'm really glad i did that i feel i feel much better that's your job your your job you you, you know as an <laughs> escort that is your fucking job just like an actor or anybody else it's to make people feel better Right. Yeah. The sooner you realize that as yeah. an escort, and, it, and obviously it's for the uh, the obvious ways. Sometimes, like just a good pounding, but uh, sometimes yep. it's. But feel good doesn't always mean that. It could mean, like you said, being there, being Connect, empathetic, connecting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that all encompasses f- of making somebody feel good, and I'm glad you got that. And. Yeah, I think that's why I enjoyed it so much was because I didn't feel like, first off, I didn't feel like I was your typical male escort in that I wasn't like a big, huge bodybuilder and I wasn't like, you know, gorgeous face. And, you know, I was kind of like a regular guy. Um, And so I had insecurities about was I good enough for this? But then as I found out as I went on that, yeah. I was good. I was better than good enough because I have a sensitivity and and a way to kind of turn an hour around in maybe a surprising way for the client, you know, or, or and as a listener to really know like, okay, David, shut up now. This guy needs to <laughs> he needs to vent, so let him do it, you know. Whatever. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the one thing I'm impressed with, and this brings us t- towards um, where you're kind of at now, is it seems with ageism, and we talk a lot about ageism on this podcast mm-hmm. in general, and how it's just so rampant, but it, you know, with shame and you know, even with your escorting, you were not wanting to share with everybody for obvious reasons throughout the years. And you talk a lot about your body shaming that you experience. I feel like you didn't, correct me if I'm wrong, suffer from ageism. Like you didn't feel that as much because you, it just, I didn't get that from you. Can you talk about that? I mean, the few times I felt I really experienced ages, and I talk about in the book, when I would go to sex parties sometimes, and, right. you know, and I was at a party that was supposedly, like, you had to audition for the party. Right, but then <laughs> they I, let I, you in. And so, then they yeah. let me in, right. And I thought, oh, though, this means everybody's going to be into everybody else. And it was, no, not always. Sometimes the younger, I was, you know, it was about when I was escorting, so I was in, like, mid-30s. And there were younger guys who looked at me as if I was, you know, covered in dog poo or something. It was, <laughs> It was, like... Oh, ugh, you know, fine. But I guess it seems in reading the book, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're that was the one area like you've been such a soldier and a marching forward in your life that that's the one thing that you were able to kind of just like power through and like, fine, if you're not into me, well, I'm going to go over here. Sure, uh, it took a know. while to get there though, because um, I had to deal with my own dealing with the fact that I was aging anyway, you know, myself. And trying to stay healthy and trying to, you know, keep fit and everything like that. And, you know, being naked on the internet and in photos definitely is a good, uh, um, good reason to, to, to stay yes, in shape. Yes, the motivator um, factor. It's a yeah. good motivator, although not always. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm loosening up a little bit more and kind of being like, no, I want to kind of portray whatever's there, you know. Um but I think that the only thing I'll say ageism wise, because I do get a lot of young guys who approach me or, you know, on Scruff or I get messages on OnlyFans from younger guys and stuff that it's, it's nice knowing that, like, as I try to tell older guys who think that they're done and nobody wants them and guys their own age won't even look at them and like, well, there are guys out there who like older guys. So yeah. you can't you can't give up and you can't decide that you're redundant because you're not. You're only redundant if you make yourself that way. So I, to me, I'm finding that, like one thing I don't 
I usually won't do though is like I won't necessarily come on to a younger guy unless I know that they're interested. Because I still right. don't want that look like, ugh, grandpa, get away from me, you know. That right. still that still does not feel great. But it rolls off my back because whatever, you know. Yeah. Um I but there's a lot of people who feel defeated by their age. And I don't want them to. I want them to know that they're still vital, that they're still, you know, there's still people out there for them if they are looking. And even if you're not looking, there's things you can do sexually that maybe you never did before, you know, that maybe you were scared of doing to kind of put a little zing into your sex life or finding somebody who likes that kind of thing and goes, oh, let's do it together, you know? This is why people need to read Damn Shame because you really do a good job of just that point of encouraging and and pivoting into today, you're still writing material, it's music, and your acting career is still thriving. But I was really happy that although you're not escorting anymore, you have an OnlyFans page? I do. I okay, do. now tell us. And where can people find it? Okay, well... Um... I st well, first of all, I've been posing for photos for years and years and years. You have like a body of work. <laughs> I, I do have a body of work because it's been, you know, 20 plus And a hot body years. too, I might add. Well, it's, you're I very was, kind. Thank yes, you. no. <laughs> and I had started, um, and they were all kind of living in photographers' notebooks and on JPEGs and stuff. But when Tumblr came along, I started posting photos. I had a I be I created a blog called Shameless. And I started to put the, these photo sets together and started posting them. And that was like, and I would try to be creative about it and try to be artsy and sometimes just blatantly triple X, whatever. Um, and I did that for five years until Tumblr purged adult material. So then I moved it all to OnlyFans, not charging a subscription because it's what I did at Tumblr. And then, and I started to shoot some videos um, for a, a filmmaker friend of mine, Faye Films. And we shot a couple of erotic videos and I was really enjoying it, but I just didn't kind of know where they would go. And he was going to be part of a festival that was showing little sex films. So I was like, great, use that. Well, then lockdown came along and COVID. Right. And I thought, wow, here's what I'm going to do. This is what I've always wanted to do. I want to post the videos we're making, but I don't want to do it so that any looky-loo who's going to come and judge it can do that. Even though the photos were always out there for people to do the same. But right. the video made me feel a little more. But that's um, a little vulnerable. more. And in the business of tiered business, where you can, you know, charge a little something for a little more. Well, that's what I decided to do. And so um, in March of last year, I turned my OnlyFans into a subscription page. And ever since then, I've been creating videos and photo, photo sets. And I do like role play stuff. I do some, every so often a duo or a trio, um, a DIY sex toys. Um, I do all kinds of stuff. And what I've found lately that I really enjoy is telling behind the scenes stories of the videos or taking a photo and either telling what actually happened in the photo or making up a really spicy, filthy, dirty little story about it. Um, I'm just kind of putting my that brain that I've always had, that kind of sexual, you know, creative, kind of creative dogs, like I do with anything else I would do as a writer or an actor to really kind of like delve deep into the moment. And I write those stories and people seem to really like them. And I love writing them. Um, I've done, I've done audio books where I've done people's um, uh, gay erotica where I've narrated them. And I love doing it because I love talking about sex. I love thinking about sex. I love writing about sex. And I'm finding that OnlyFans has become this like multi-tiered um, ability for me. Sometimes the videos are very kind of artsy and esoteric. And sometimes it's like, here I am getting fucked. I mean, it, it, it's, it's kind of, it runs the gamut, but I, I'm so proud of the creativity that I've brought to it. It's not, I don't think it's like, I won't say it's like, not like anybody else's page because I don't know that for sure. But I know right. that I'm doing it my way. And that everything I put up there has some other element besides just sex. There's humor or you know, creativity or emotion or um, storytelling. And it's been really fun. So it's OnlyFans.com slash RealGuyLA. Love it. And I don't, right, use, I, I don't use my name there because it, when I first set up the OnlyFans, I was like, well, I said David Pevsner on the Tumblr page, but... 
this is going to be a little more intense. So I use the name that I like have on hookup sites, Real Guy LA. Yep. But over the, you know, the past year and stuff, I'm kind of like, you know, I should really change it, but I can't really do that right now um, because I'm, I have no shame about it. The only thing I do say about what I post is I don't like sometimes when people maybe steal them and put them elsewhere because right. I, I'm not making this material for the people who want to like be the looky-loos and go, oh, look at that. I'm not making it for them. I'm making it for the people who want to see it. You know? Absolutely. And that's the basis. Yeah, I think you're doing the right thing. And you, I'm glad that OnlyFans is copyrighted. So you own the material. Yeah, and, but, it, it, you know, yeah. sometimes people do what they're do not supposed anyway. to do. And, yeah. and I, I don't really, it's not that I care about the fact that this is the way I'm making a living. And it's not fair for you to take it away from me for free. But right. I also feel like, you know, if something makes it out there, I used to feel like, oh, no, now the whole world, all these judgy people now. I don't care. Come at me. Tell me what you think about it. But let's have the conversation. Why does it bother you so much? You know, why is it, why, you know, just why does sexuality, it's just so, you know, it's, it's such an, a conversation to have that we're not having, you know, right. well, we really just, in depth, really in depth. I'm talking. We are definitely having it here. And I love towards the end of damn shame you say things i am an artist i have something to say i love when you uh created this rule one of my favorite people in the world the vanessa williams rule mm -hmm. i just adore her i've got yeah. to interview her and she's you essentially say essentially when she had her whole nude pictures come out she owned it and don't apologize and lastly, your friend Steve said, take control of your own story. Yeah. I think words to live by, it seems that's exactly what you're doing and continue to do. Um, David, such a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, and talk thank about, you. Yeah, absolutely. I've had a great time. Uh, yeah, Damn Shame, a memoir, Desire, Defiance, and Show Tunes is out today, Jan January 11th, correct? It's a big day, yes. Oh, my God. That's when this is out, this podcast. So, yeah, a day before my birthday. The 12th oh, is my birthday. Happy birthday. So, yeah. We're both Thank Capricorns. You. We, oh, you're a Capricorn. What's your I'm birthday? New Year's Eve. I, in okay. fact, I, I turned 63, actually. So, we, you know, nice. we need we need to update, update our press uh, material. <laughs> Okay, here we are, right when this came out. I love it. Damn Shame's the book. Get it. It's a great read. David Pevsner, thank you so much. I really enjoyed reading this and keep in contact. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with David Pevsner. You can find out all the links to his special on Prime, his book, Damn Shame, and his OnlyFans page. Also, little fact that we didn't get to, he's responsible for Naked Boys singing, putting that together, the infamous show that tours and has been touring for so many years. But check out, go to tagspodcast.com for that. Don't forget, my birthday is this Wednesday, January 12th, and we are live with Tags Live with Cody Maurice Doggett and myself at 6 o'clock Pacific Time, 9 o'clock Eastern Time on the Get Vocal platform. I will post this on tagspodcast.com. And in the meantime, continue having hot gay sex.